So before we get started, I just want to get you familiar with the IFDA in case some of you are newcomers. Um, we are a nonprofit organization with a mission to support education and your advancement to the trade of interior design. We also have grants. Uh, if you're a member, you're eligible to for some of our professional grants as well as students, and uh, we also have competitions. Um, first off, I'd love to thank our sponsors with International Gold Sponsors, Natuzi, International Silver Sponsor, Huntsler Douglas, New York Chapter Gold Sponsors, Benjamin Moore, Kravit, Stacy Garcia, Seegermans, Resource Furniture, 200 Lex, and Silver Sponsors, American Hardware, Fisher & Paykel, 41 Madison, Hoffley America, New York Now, and Toto. Now, uh, the presentation I'm about to give you was funded by an IFDA grant. Um, and in order to be eligible for an IFDA grant, you need to be a member and you'll enjoy many perks with IFDA. Uh, by becoming a member, you'll be supported by our community and you'll be able to interact and get involved in whatever level you'd like to. Our grants have been extended to August 31st due to COVID. So be sure and look into that, decide what ones you would like to take advantage of and make your application. Additionally, the American Scandinavian Society has also extended their grants for cultural arts. If you do have a Scandinavian background in the arts, it's an excellent opportunity to promote your work, um, to receive the award and to fund uh, a project you're working on. So without further ado, let me just minimize this image here. Scandinavian trends. Um, so what we're gonna talk about today is not so much focused around color, concept, silhouette, and pattern. What I wanna talk about with you more is very cultural-oriented, attitudinal trends coming from Scandinavia that are starting to affect the globe and are kind of reverberating throughout and sort of resonating back and forth and changing and evolving. These overarching attitudinal trends um, are affecting design and I want to talk about how that's affecting design and where the opportunities are because you are the future you are designing the future um, so let this be inspiration and take uh, what this is worth to you and your area of design to move forward one thing I do want to talk about as far as trends because oftentimes in the US we talk about trends again in um, product assortment color and it's more topical and aesthetic um, so the idea of mega trends are actually more long-term and directional shifts. They affect large amounts of the population, often on a global scale. Examples of these are uh, urbanization, automation, and climate change. Now, I went to, on the grant, I went to Copenhagen uh, to study future studies with the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies. Um, I wanted to learn a methodology called scenarios planning, and that is a thought process, somewhat like design thinking in which we discuss and think through four quarantines of possibilities, opportunities, and threats within the marketplace and identify um, how to act out according to trends, according to business opportunities, um, mitigating risks, and um, taking advantage of opportunities in the market shifts. So again, we look at megatrends. And at the time I was taking the class, which was in 2018, um, certainly megatrends have shifted since then, but this is a slide um, based on the, the megatrends that they had identified, and again, these have a lifetime of about 10 to 15 years. So these are overarching ideas that are influencing things on, on a bunch of different levels, not just in the design world. Um, they're, uh, they're synergistic opportunity and they have opportunities among them. There's also threats. And we also talk about black swans or wild cards. Um, these are things that are unanticipated. Uh, many believe that COVID-19 was not considered a black swan, but it certainly did take people by surprise. And in that case it is, but there are certainly opportunities available um, in that event. So this is what we're talking about when we talk about megatrends. So overarching themes I wanna talk about as far as cultural attitudes in Scandinavia um, is experiential learning, sustainability, humanity in public spaces, cultivating nature and relationships, and play. We'll start with expansive learning because again, that's why I went there. Um, I took a three-day workshop with the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies. I was also there to research how Scandinavian culture informs urban design and interiors. Uh, it's known as the happiest place on earth and I wanted to know how design impacts that and um, how they create um, this environmental effect of contentment. 
So scenarios planning, again, it's a methodology, much like design thinking, well, I shouldn't say much like, but uh, the closest thing that is coming to the U.S. that people may be more familiar with are methodologies like design thinking and other forecasting methodologies. Um, it's a tool, again, uh, to identify opportunities, mitigate risks, to structure thinking around the future, and to enable stakeholders uh, to build buy-in. So it's something we do in, in an approach uh, to building business. It's also something we do in identifying how businesses should move forward. In the case of the workshop we did was with Cucho uh, to look at what the future might look like with energy alternative vehicles and in shifts uh, through ownership or um, access. So do things go more in the public, public transportation world or do people still insist on owning their vehicles? So these are the conversations that we build strategies around. Um, one of my favorite things about scenarios planning is that it talks about the wild card, the uncertainties. It challenges people to look for the opportunities in the difficult. Um, and it also has the mindset of creating the future. It's not about identifying and predicting what's going to happen. It's about looking at the possibilities, seeing the playing field for what it is, and then playing the game according to where you want to go in that context. And it's identifying the various scenarios of that game and moving in the directions towards that game as it shifts. That's what I love about it. It's identifying opportunities and it's very creative. Um, it helps you think more expansively as opposed to limitations. And that's why I like it more than many of the other trend methodologies that seem to have more limitations and really rely on um, data from the past and not looking into the future. We can't move forward with change if we're constantly inventing according to data and bestsellers. So experiential learning. Um, one of the first places I went to when we landed in Copenhagen was the Danish Architecture Center. And I was super impressed by not only the exhibitions, um, but the DAC workspace. It was open to the community, it was open to professionals, it's open to children, it's open to students. And the plethora of creativity and influence that I saw there was so refreshing. I feel like educational structures within the US often are more about reiterating information and knowing the right way to proceed. This was very experimental. It was about practice, it was about process, it was about curiosity, it was about imagination, and of course drawing within the architecture world that's very important but drawing only comes gets better with practice design only gets better with practice invention only gets better with practice so i really enjoyed this approach to experiential learning having patience imagining the possibilities and just going with your nature and moving forward with that in constant dedicated deliberate practice it was a mind-blowing shift in what learning has always been to me. So moving forward with that, um, last year a book came out from Finland with a lot of research on um, schools in Finland, which have been touted to be some of the best schools in the world. And um, the book is called Let the Children Play. It reports several studies on open, self-directed play being developmental and essential to children development through the age of seven before they start actual schooling structure as similar to the way we know it to be in the US. Um, studies show that the children end up more curious, more willing to discover, more um, agile at failing and problem solving and creatively learning to adapt. It's a very interesting book. I highly recommend reading it. But again, this approach to open-ended self-directed creativity and the child's innate desire to learn and play with its environment and be a part of nature, I think is a fundamental value in Scandinavia that we've somewhat become detached from here in the US as schools eliminate recess, as schools eliminate art programs, as schools structure the educational, um, the educational system such that children are not self-led and aren't exploring what's in, the, in them to do in a creative way. So looking at those attitudes coming from Scandinavia, I think are going to influence the way we learn and play in the US and especially how we raise our children. I would also go further to argue that I feel a sense of creative play in the workplace for adults, now that we're moving into a knowledge-based workforce as opposed to the industrial workforce, 
that play and creativity and creative thinking is going to be a bigger asset to the workforce than it ever has been. Where thinking like design thinking and scenario planning is gonna be a much bigger part of everybody's day-to-day -day job and role. And that leads us to sustainability. I do believe that this overarching idea of experiential learning pollinates all areas of these continued trends. So sustainability, we've heard a lot about, we talk a lot about it here in the US. Um, it's almost become a branding element on a topical level in some cases, uh, but I see it being more at the core of invention and design in Scandinavia, and that's making its way here. So slow fashion, one of the interesting things about the fashion industry here in the US, and we're seeing this happen, is uh, it's sort of imploding in on itself. Um, there's certainly more product available than people are open to, willing to, or interested in buying. Um, what we saw when we went to Oslo Fashion Week and in talking with many of the designers was this idea of slow fashion. And WGSN had reported this back in 2017 as a 2020 trend. So it's not exclusively to Scandinavia, it's already influencing us here in the US and designers are already taking a step back. Just before COVID shut down, um, Philip Lim announced that he was taking a step back and they weren't going to create a collection this year and he was gonna take some time off and regroup with his design team and decide what directions they wanted to go. Several other designers as reported by WWD um, reported the same and then COVID happened. So there is clearly this desire within the fashion industry to slow down and really think about what we're designing, what we're creating, the meaning of it, the significance of it, and what that is. That's already been part of the heritage in Scandinavia. Um, Ingun Berkland very much creates her ball gowns with this hand-woven technique with ribbons and embroidery. Tanya Plur uses some embroidery techniques to create these amazing textiles with some nubby textures and color and vibrant patterns. And they're all rooted in this hand in nature of things. Uh, additionally, there's a lot of collaboration across sectors. So Rora's Tweed is a wool, uh, wool blankets and soft goods company. They've been around since 1940. Um, it's pure Norwegian wool, and they collaborate with these modern designers to create very interesting textiles. But they're very much rooted, again, in the hand and heritage and sustainability of production in design and how they create these blankets. I have one of their blankets and it brings me joy every time I use it, every time I touch it. It's just one of the most wonderful things in my home right now. Further afield, Haymat is a floor mat company out of Norway. Again, we have a lot of sustainability branded to products, but when experiencing this particular product, it's made with the sensibility of industrial quality design. These floor mats will not fall apart. They're machine washable. They don't slip, they don't buckle, they don't bend. They're gorgeous and they have the highly Scandinavian aesthetic. They're made with the, in, with the intuition of people who have been in the industry for a very long time and they're made to quality. They're made to do what they do. So it's a very thoughtful process and again, sustainable at the core root of the product. It's not just something to add to it. The products are even 50% and in some cases 100% made of recycled material. These are very thoughtful designs coming from Scandinavia and those attitudes are coming to the US. They've been in the US in some cases, especially with independent small designers like yourselves. On a larger scale, sustainable recreation. So uh, big architects, they created this ski hill that is on top of a waste management plant that incinerates waste to heat homes in Copenhagen. Uh, it's part of a green initiative where Copenhagen wants to be completely green by 2025. It's an innovative solution. It's brilliant. They don't even generate or man-make snow. It's a special carpet that people ski down and there's hiking trails, there's recreation. It's, there's not a lot of hills in uh, Denmark. So creating this ski hill allows for greater recreation without further travel, adding to the quality of life within the city. Again, this connection to creating um, adventures and creating nature within an urban setting is a, is a very Scandinavian thing that we're craving here in the U.S., especially during shutdown, where all of a sudden our urban environments have become very cumbersome where we can't escape. 
Another very interesting thing I noticed when in uh, Copenhagen and Norway, Teslas seem to be everywhere. Where here it's such a highly sought after luxury item, it's almost like seeing a unicorn drive past you. When I summoned an Uber and a Tesla showed up and my ride was there, I was blown away by the fact that at an average price of an Uber, I was riding in a Tesla. Um, asking questions around, I wanted to find out exactly why this, why it was so possible that it seemed accessible to have a Tesla, but not so much here in the US. Well, it turns out there are tax incentives to buying a Tesla in Scandinavian countries. And it's part of the green initiative of energy alternative fossil fuel um, initiatives. So it occurred to me that in the US, well, I mean, globally, uh, de design is influenced by legislation, by majority motivations, by oil, by um, whatever other adjacent areas can influence these things. So that affects design, that affects the evolution of design, that affects how much forward something like a Tesla can push that idea. Um, the availability of it and the marketability of it affects how much farther you can go with that idea. So that was a really interesting revolution to me. I find it extremely interesting. But again, there are other adjacencies to incentivizing things. In some countries, it's not so much an incentive to uh, start your own business, to be entrepreneurial. Uh, it may almost be impossible as far as tax structures. But here in the US, it's highly prioritized. There are tax structures in place for you to run your own business. Many people do, and many people will start three to five businesses in their lifetime. So again, these incentivized accesses based on governmental legislation and attitudinal shifts within a, within a culture of a country have to do with invention and bringing, bringing pollinating priorities from other countries and considering those things might help us grow and expand into other areas that we had not considered in the past, being a fuel-based industry country um, at the moment. And that leads us to humanity in public spaces. So in this pandemic, again, in urban settings, people are finding that their living quarters aren't exactly accommodating to the lifestyle we're now becoming familiar with. Especially in New York City, you got yourself whatever apartment you could get when you first moved here in your 20s, and you spent most of your time outside networking, being part of the cool crowds and doing cool things. In lockdown, can you imagine being in a uh, five floor walk, 500 square foot apartment walk up with nearly no windows. Uh, that is actually calling into question people's sanity and causing depression right now. So public spaces are going to be a bigger part of a concern in cities like New York City, LA, as this pandemic moves forward and even into the future of how we're designing urban spaces. So one of the areas in Scandinavia that I also found quite fascinating in Denmark was the pedestrian, it's one of the longest pedestrian um, shopping areas in Europe. Uh, it's, high, it's a highly bikeable city. It's very pedestrian oriented. There's a lot of public transportation and they prefer that you take public transportation in that um, they make it very uncomfortable to necessarily drive your own car around the city incentivizing these kinds of modes of transportation, which also leads to health and well-being of people because they're walking more, they're more active. Now, it rains a lot uh, in Scandinavia, and so the weather isn't ideal. I can't imagine Americans being as willing to uh, schlep through the rain on their bicycles, but hopefully we're moving in that direction with the advent of city bikes coming to New York City. Um, these kinds of ideas are happening, and they did shut down Broadway to a degree to create pedestrian uh, accessibility and more places for people to hang out in public spaces. So we are moving in these directions and people are seeing the value of these public spaces. Again, with COVID being what it is and the pandemic emerging the way it is, it's going to change Fifth Avenue. It's going to change the way we shop. It's going to change retail. So these considerations of public open air shopping spaces that are pedestrian in downtown areas are going to be a consideration for urban design. Another super fascinating thing I saw when I was there were these, um, well, it started with these trampolines in the street. Now, I don't know that you could really necessarily implement those in the US. There would be a high degree of liability for the city, um, probably vandalism that would endanger people's lives. But what I loved about it in Denmark was that it was a moment of playfulness on a street in a very busy business area. It wasn't just like this was a playground and if you happen to be there with your kid, you could hop on it and have a little delightful moment. This was in a very serious area of business every day. 
and people were enjoying them. People took a little hop. People um, got to enjoy these sculptural areas to sit. There were hammocks um, lining the business financial area, play areas that didn't look like they were just for the children. And I love that. Also, again, big architects designed a Viking park called Super Killen um, in Denmark. And it's brightly colored. There's bike paths, there's sculptures to sit on. There's a lot of interaction and bright happiness everywhere designed into this place for people to really enjoy the community, to play and to be together. That's again, something that's going to be highly considered in these urban spaces as we realize we can't all convene in small areas anymore. And that leads again to, so you saw that uh, big architect um, bike paths, all in those bright colors. So public art, public art for public good. Now statistics have shown that a community that is able to express itself and to bring art into public spaces has a much more well-rounded and balanced attitude and less depression involved. So this artist, uh, he's Finnish born, um, Swedish raised and New York based, is a mural artist, Tony Showman, and he's been creating works all over the city in New York City and globally. Uh, most recently he's been in, he's in, done some installations in Starbucks. And I'm going, and I think there's going to be more of this, more retailers, more, restaurant tours and more public spaces, again, are going to be integrating experiences of art into the private sector. It's not going to just be in museums anymore. It's not going to just be for the elite. It's not going to be just for the connoisseur of art. Art is for everyone, and it's going to be wildly embraced as a cultural difference. What I love about this particular aesthetic is Showman is influenced by graffiti. He is influenced by Keith Haring, but he's brought this Scandinavian aesthetic to it of this sense of calm, the sense of reflection, almost like a sunset on the city on the city landscape, on what the buildings look like, glistening the sun as the sun transitions and changes. That reflectiveness of urban living, that um, contemplation, that sense of purpose, that sense of belonging is highly communicated in his work and it's expanding across New York City, it's expanding globally, and that, that aesthetic I think is going to be a sense of calm in these urban, in these urban settings. So we're going to look to art to self-actualize, to bring us into the future, to really express our humanity and what it means to be in an urban space and have community. So cultivating nature and relationships. Again, at the very core of all things Scandinavia is the relationship with nature. Um, here in the US, I think, especially in urban areas, I mean, I grew up in the country and I live in the city now, and there is a bit of a disconnect I experience um, where nature isn't as present and it's something you have to really deliberately choose and uh, seek out. And it can often be very cumbersome to pursue that. It can take you several hours to get to the shore. It can take you, it might, you might even only be able to save it for vacation time. Two weeks in the summer, you get to actually be involved in nature. Um, in these urban areas in Scandinavia, it's still very much accessible to get out to nature. Their parks are much more wildlife driven with the gardens and open space. And there's just this general appreciation and preser preservation of nature in day-to-day -day experiences that um, has slightly been removed from our urban areas and maybe taken for granted in other areas of the US. So urban gardening, was a major theme for Catherine Hamill, fashion designer in Oslo. Uh, her runway collection was, um, was viewed through this urban setting. As you can see, it very densely populated area, but this beautiful garden, she's wearing high fashion. And it was an expression of this desire to create clothing that's highly functional, that can live with you every day, that's not so precious that you, you can't sweat, you can't walk down the street, you can't dig in the garden, you can't really experience nature in this, in this world of fashion. So she was really integrating some functional clothing with the idea that nature and urban living can be synergistically and simultaneously experienced as the human condition. I really love that. The collection was absolutely gorgeous. And I think we're going to see more of that going forward in fashion, in product, in urban settings. And further afield, uh, when I was in Copenhagen, Outside my Airbnb, I noticed all these green roofs and interesting architecture. Uh, Wake Up Copenhagen is a really cool um, hotel that was just off in the distance from my view outside. I even sketched it. Um, but green rooftops are also part of that Copenhagen initiative to be green by 2025. Um, it rains a lot in Copenhagen, so the green roofs help to absorb some of that water. 
and um, also adding to the oxygen. They also foster wildlife, birds, um, and animals. So again, cultivating nature in the urban setting isn't as difficult a thing as we think it is, and we certainly can employ rooftops in a greater way in these urban places in the U.S. and really improve the quality of the air in the city and the quality of life and even adding to the value of the amenities in the buildings that people are choosing to live in. So again, that's going to be something that's, that will be designed towards the future as we move forward with this new awareness based on the pandemic. Uh, another thing, um, and we, you know, we have all this social justice conversation going on. We've obviously not solved these problems, and it's it's time to really consider these things. Another interesting thing we noticed in Oslo was um, the safe space for refugees. There were a lot of refugees there that seemed to feel very comfortable and at home. And I know years ago, uh, when Obama was president, there was a massive move to bring refugees to small cities in the U.S. And there was a bit of friction from people that already lived in those cities and a disconnect between cultural integration and what was going on. Uh, there has to be some, some level of comfort, there has to be some education, there has to be some support within those communities to foster refugees moving to these spaces. You have to understand these people are coming from horrible, scary places into another horrible, scary situation where the, there's a lot of unknown. What I saw and felt in Oslo was that there was a safe space there where people could express themselves. And this particular artist, uh, Manu Mar, did an art installation where, uh, well, he was, he's a Sudanese artist and he's homosexual. In Sudan, it's the death penalty if you're um, found guilty of being gay. It's amazingly painful to believe that there are any, there's any place on this earth um, where that's possible. Uh, so he lost his family, he lost his friends, and he had to leave. So this art installation, um, there's a saying in Sudanese, a Sudanese proverb, where if you no longer have a family, make your own with clay. So this was a cathartic process he turned into an art installation where he created his people in clay, he created his community in clay, and he urges other people to do so through a workshop. If you're feeling disconnected from your people in a similar way because of something that's just at the core of who you are, um, he's provided this expression and he's been doing it globally. Um, so again, that, that sense of refugee that's coming from you know, Norway, that willingness to include other people um, in diversity is, is a really amazing thing that's going to be a louder call to action here in the U.S., which we're already seeing. And another wonderful thing I loved about Norway is there's this saying, there's no bad weather, only bad clothing. Um, at uh, Norwegian Rain, a uh, clothing company, on their window, it says, it rains in Oslo. And that is a dramatic understatement. <laughs> and what I love about that is it means that the clothing there is highly quality, high quality, highly durable, highly functional. Um, it's very well thought out design. And I found that so interesting um, because here, again, even growing up in a rural area in northern Wisconsin, we actually avoided the outdoors. I avoided the outdoors for a very long time, um, not really believing that it was possible to be warm uh, in 20 below weather, but it is. <laughs> uh, there's also this shoe company called Swims um, that was invented and based upon, their designs are based upon, you know those rubber sleeves you put over your shoes to go out into the mud or um, to go deal with the garden or whatever. Uh, they invented a modern design shoe based on those rubber sleeves. So again, that forward thinking, that bringing uh, heritage into modern day and creating a highly functional, highly modern design um, that lives with you and can be high fashion, but also utilitarian, that you can wear through the mud, things like that. I really found very fascinating and I really appreciate about Norwegian design. So that cultivating a relationship with nature, it goes through design, it goes through lifestyle. They're very much um, in, the, in the water, they're in the ocean, they're in the forest, it's highly active lifestyle. And I do believe that it builds humor, humanity, community, um, and informs the way design is, design is approached. It's not about selling product endlessly, it's about creating product that serves. And I think that's a, a beautiful takeaway, and I think we're going to be moving more and more towards that design approach here in the U.S., realizing there's just too much product to sell, and we really need to be able to compete in a highly functional way and deliver value to the consumer. So touching all of these aspects, uh, again, is the sensibility of play. Um, it touches all these categories. It's really this cultural desire and 
and culturally founded sense of discovery, curiosity, where learning is baked into everyday experiences, where delight, humor, and humanity is baked into everyday experiences. These are things I uh, tend to miss in some cases um, in urban settings, especially in the workplace. I feel like we often take ourselves very seriously and we're very much here to compete. Um, and this collaborative idea of humanity and curiosity and willingness to learn and discover, to test and scale, um, coming out of Scandinavia is gonna be more and more a part of our culture in the workplace, in design, and day to day. So, just a few examples of product. Um, these just show like clever, functional, playful color and composition and design. This is all very much a Scandinavian aesthetic. Um, it certainly is here in the US, but it's going to be a bigger, it's going to be, be coming out in a bigger way. And it's also going to evolve. I mean, as our culture informs that culture and people start to meld things together. We're becoming a globe and we have been a global economy. Um, certain things maybe want to take that in a different direction, but designers are going to move forward with what's practical, what's inspiring, what's colorful, what's playful, what's joyful. And that's where we're going to go. So these kinds of elements you're going to see more and more of. And I do want to cover one um, overarching thing. And if you ask any Scandinavian about the Yante Loven, Law of Yante, uh, it's this idea in 10 rules that culturally enforce, culturally enforce that you are not anyone special and that you should not think you're better than anyone else. Um, that's highly antagonistic to the American idea that everyone is special and that um, we all sort of have this exclusivity and entitlement to being great, to pursuit of happiness, um, to the pursuit of greatness. Um, some patterns that I saw in marketing in Scandinavia, particularly with Carlsberg and the, the Danish beer, um, had a giant sign that said probably the best beer in the world. I was tickled laughing ridiculously when I saw that because of the understatement and just sort of humble but boastful way of putting that was so different than anything I've seen in the US. I mean, we're used to Kool-Aid man bursting through the walls. Everything's awesome and amazing and the best here. So this idea that something is still the best, but only probably, I thought was a really clever marketing tactic. And of course, that has to come to the US. So there is this Dr. Smood Cafe in New York City that was founded in 2014 by a Danish fellow. Um, and it, of course, uses probably the healthiest cafe in New York. I'm not sure how Carlsberg feels about be having their slogan taken and reappropriated in the US, but I love the understatement and subtlety, cleverness and humor that's just kind of baked into things that come out of Scandinavia. So we're gonna see more of that also. So with that, I just wanna reiterate um, this idea of this highly competitive American way and this idea of the do not stick out and do not be particularly unique, I believe is going to move into this melding pot on this global level of, especially with social justice as a creed and call to action. It's going to move into we're all unique and we all have something of value to offer. And I think that's gonna be the most important thing driving the future of design. And I wanna share that with you as our final statement and open the floor to questions. Do we have any questions? So if anyone wants to raise their hand or drop a question in the chat box, um, here, here's a question for you. Um, Irene said, Garrett, why do you say Scandinavian design will be seen more in the USA? Why and how will it have a greater presence? And what is that strategy? Uh, indeed. Well, we do have more Scandinavian brands coming to the US, but I guess what I mean more so is not that Scandinavian design will be more prevalent in the US, but that these influences, these overarching influences that drive that simplicity, functionality, um, and cleverness in design is going to be part of design in the US, regardless of whether it's um, clearly Scandinavian or um, just sort of part of our cultural movement towards a different attitude as we move forward in design, really being more conscious as creators in the US of what we're selling, who we're selling it to, and what its function is for and how long it lasts in the environment. Um, and that strategy uh, is going to be informed by this crisis, for sure. It's also informed by crises we've been experiencing. So again, that fashion industry has been crumbling for quite some time. 
Um, luxury is, has shifted. It's not so much about status. It's not about, again, that idea of being special. Um, it's gotta be more serving than that. It's gotta be more um, personally expressive than that. So the strategy is gonna be more about the individual, but less about superiority. It's gonna be about personal self-expression. And um, whether you notice that as being purely Scandinavian or coming from Scandinavia, it's going to be culturally informing from the US and those attitudes reflect that. Did that answer the question? Did I miss something there? I think so. I think this like higher quality, more thoughtfulness in design is really important yeah. that we incorporate that more. Right. Sue Hilty would like to have you speak more about design thinking. Ah, we could do a whole nother webinar on that one. Um, speak more like a specific question or just tell about it or why, why it's important. She said, you mentioned design thinking. Can you talk more about this? Sure. Well, design thinking you want is to another. Chime in. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just saying if Sue wants to add anything, yes. she's welcome. Sue, did to you want to add anything? Here. I'm. Blah, blah, blah. Here, am I unmuted? You are? You are. Oh, good, good, good. Okay, I just wanted to touch base with you. Wonderful presentation, loved your sketches, loved your thought process. So I'm sure everyone agrees with me on that. But I would like to Thank have you. you talk a little bit about design thinking, because as you know, um, it's, a, it's a new aspect in our world of, of School of Human Ecology back in Madison, Wisconsin, mm. and it's important. And how does it relate to Scandinavian design? Talk to me a little bit. You don't have to go into what is design thinking, but talk to us a little bit about the, the meld of Scandinavian trends, scenarios, gotcha. versus design thinking. Got you, and thank you for that question and for the clarification, because it is a broad subject, so I just wanted to be sure to um, pinpoint what you really wanted to relate to. So amazing that uh, Madison has that as part of the educational um, curriculum, because uh, design thinking started in the 60s, and it was more of an architecture-geared based thought process to um, solving wicked problems in the design space. Um, it has since become very popular, and it's gaining momentum within the design process and even the strategy process of business in that it's more collaborative, it brings in a multitude of perspectives to inform wicked problems. Um, and wicked problems are things that uh, aren't, aren't so easy to solve. And you, um, we often don't know what we don't know. So uh, design thinking is meant to uncover the aspects and assumptions that we have when we're approaching design um, that may cause it to be uh, less designed, or less good design or um, fall short of its market value or function. So design thinking is a process in which more stakeholders and more inputs are aggregated to inform the design, to test the idea, and to learn, redesign, test, learn, and scale. So you get a better product in the end result by evaluating it. And why that um, seems to be reflected of Scandinavia is when I was there and I was taking these courses and I was visiting organizations and talking with people in the workforce, it seemed like it was already an approach to their professional lifestyle in every aspect of the people that I talked with. It just seemed like it was already part of the office conversation, that way of thinking, not necessarily that they employed a sprint every time they wanted to solve a problem, but that culturally they approach problem solving collaboratively and knowing that they don't know what they don't know. And I think again, that comes back from um, Law of Yanta is that um, I'm not smarter than everyone else. I have something to offer, but I need to know more. So that curiosity and willingness to be humble in the face of design uh, I think is whether you call it Scandinavian coming to the U.S. or just part of design thinking, it's culturally going to move us forward in businesses where we are now designing in wicked problem state almost ubiquitously um, and we'll need to be able to design from a place of we don't know. So I hope that answers your question, Sue. <laughs> I've got more questions for you. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. um, okay. How do you see the mindset of happiness is impacting the trends in Scandinavia? Do you see it's impacting the mindsets of other cities? Uh, repeat that. I just want to be sure that's right. The impact of happiness. How do you see the mindset of happiness 
impacting trends in Scandinavia and impacting mindsets in other cities. Mm, right. Well, happiness is a huge part of the conversation. And we even saw it five years ago as design was moving towards, I mean, just even on the topical level where rainbow was becoming more popular. And again, that had to do also with the LBGQ um, demanding attention, demanding equal rights. Um, and then also just people wanting to sort of self-therapy in these difficult times. So we're seeing glitter, we're seeing unicorns, we're seeing um, this, uh, you know, space travel, like all these ideas of bigger, expansive thinking and, and, um, and specialness. And that's all leading to the idea of happiness that we're all looking for. And we're um, highly anxious society. So happiness in design um, is part of that. That's why we're using happy colors. That's why we're creating a little bit more playfulness within design um, and why we're trying to create a more democratic world through design. Um, how that, how that um, permeates in Scandinavia, I mean, there's a lot of different theories on that and I don't want to get political whatsoever. However, um, what might be considered um, a more social minded idea of organi organizing things and that works in the workplace and that's community again that um, not that, I mean, the Yanta law, not that everyone should not be special, but that everybody should be recognized equally as having value. I think it's a mind shift that, that brings value to everyday experiences where people are more happy because they know that they're valued. They're not competing with one another, but they're collaborating with one another. And I think part of our anxiety is that we are competing with each other in um, really unknown ways. We don't see the dangers, but we do feel like we've got to one up or we've got to do better or we're not good enough. Um, and that's, I think, where happiness from Scandinavia is going to uh, is going to inform design in that we're going to create these community spaces where everybody matters, where everybody has a presence, where everybody has a voice, where anybody can show up. Um, democratizing access, again, luxury as a status symbol isn't as valuable to these younger generations as it was to older generations in a different culture. Um, so luxury is really gonna be more about self-expression. Who am I? What am I bringing to the table? Not that I'm better than you, but this is how I show up and that value. So that's how happiness, I think, is going to be reflected through design and how we move forward as a culture is that everybody has, has a place to express themselves and be who they are. That's beautiful. Um, and someone wants to know if you have Scandinavian heritage. I do. <laughs> um, I'm part Swedish, Dutch, English, Latvian, and German, and who knows what else. I haven't taken those DNA tests because I'm afraid where that DNA goes, but I'm sure just like every other American, I've got it all. Yeah, I don't know. This is a little political, but we can potentially dive in unless you're uncomfortable. Um, Michelle Slovak wants to know um, if you saw like a middle class in your travels, um, I guess she's comparing it to a shrinking middle class in the US. She's wondering if you experienced that in Scandinavia. Mm. Well, that's a good question. And honestly, uh, I'm, not sure. I, I'm not sure that the middle class is shrinking in the US. I think what we consider the middle class is not expanding into exactly how much wealth the average individual enjoys. I mean, even at a lower income level, the, the wealth that we enjoy at low income, I mean, the fact that you can hold a tiny computer in your hand um, and make minimum wage is an indication of the wealth in this country. So I, I'm not sure if, I know that that's a very high conversation, but I feel like the media has made it way simpler by calling it middle class, upper class, and lower class when it really has a lot more blurry ground um, to it. And I think what the real question becomes is, do people have access to the resources they need to improve their lives and pursue happiness? So do they have access to education? Do they have access to work? Do they have access to computer, internet, um, access to public services, like these sorts of things. And that's not necessarily to say that we should drive towards um, socialism necessarily as a, as, a, as, a, as a country. If I think that's also the wrong word for it. I think it's, um, we have all this wealth and we need to design a better world with it where everybody is included and nobody is left behind, which is what I saw in Scandinavia was not that there was a separation of class, but that there wasn't anybody that seemed to be left behind. Even people who came from other countries as refugees were not being left behind. And that was interesting to me. Yeah, I think that that really plays into the next question. It's like things are, are designed more with a intent of purpose rather than status. Um, yeah. 
someone asked Garrett, do you think purpose would win over status in design? <laughs> um, well, I think status, the definition is changing. So status is really my current state, not so much, uh, again, superiority. Um, so it, again, it, I think it's a diminishing of class at all, is um, this is my status, this is who I am today. Um, I have this phone, it's glittery, it's pink, and it's, you know, full of unicorns, but tomorrow I might feel like putting on black. You know, like, status is becoming a current state, and we are very fluid, and we are self-expressive. And I think that's what the word is going to mean, and really means in design right now. I don't think it's about rank, I don't think it's about class. Um, if it is, I think it's just because those are paradigms that are still within our culture as um, things that maybe hold us back from really uh, connecting as a community. Okay, well, lots of compliments coming your way about wonderful content and what a fantastic presentation this was. Um, we're gonna wrap Thank it up you. with this, this last question. Um, was, do you see simplicity in Scandinavian design is related to happiness and wholesomeness of the Scandinavian mindset? In context to play and simple forms, do you see the purposefully complicated design process slash products are making more unhappy people in other countries? So I guess he's trying to connect simplicity with happiness mm -hmm. um, and play and simple forms playing into creating happiness um, as far as like a, a national mentality. Interesting. Well, that's a really good question. Um, I think there's room for all of it, quite honestly, and I don't think that complexity creates unhappiness. I mean, look at the Gucci aesthetic, and I'm only calling that Gucci because that's like the most recent representation of it. Certainly eclecticism and maximalism um, makes a lot of people happy, and I have to say, I always thought I'd be that person who like collects antiques and um, really just just acquires all these great textures and colors and things in the world, and those certainly make people happy, and it's a beautiful aesthetic. So I wouldn't say simplicity is the only thing that makes people happy. I think what makes people happy is having access to the things that express themselves to the fullest. So if that is complex, complex design, if that is complexity of texture, color, pattern, and silhouette, um, that certainly should be accessible. The simplicity part of it in happiness, I believe, comes from a sense of contentment within your own self, knowing that you can express yourself, and then choosing for yourself what the path of least resistance towards that is. So whether that's a simplistic aesthetic or a simple way of getting what you need, um, that's where the happiness is coming from. And maybe it's this idea in America that we need things to be happy is really the problem, not the simplicity of, I can have whatever I want, but what do I really need? Because I'm me and that's really all. So um, I think that reconsidering of what makes us happy is where the, where the simplicity is going to actually make us happy is we're going to reduce what that definition is um realizing that for the last several decades acquiring many things has not made us happy does anyone have any final questions for garrett do you have any closing statements you would like to make um well i just again thank you all so much for coming um and listening i hope you enjoyed the presentation the deck will be made available and there are certainly links within the deck, um, hyperlinks that you can um, find out more about the different companies and the different um, articles that I've written on some of the shows and things like that. So you can delve a little bit deeper into this information and decide for yourself where you think this is going and inform your design moving forward. Because again, you're the designers of the future and it's up to you what you want to create. So create the world you want to see. Wonderful. That was really fantastic. Thank you so much, Thank everyone, you. for joining us. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> we hope you join us again for another International Perspective this evening at 8 p.m. Take care. Have a great Wednesday. Bye-bye.